Hello and welcome. I am Melinda Cartwright and I'm honored to introduce UCF Victim Services Raise the Vibration, a virtual event that celebrates womanhood in all forms and empowers our campus community to end gendered violence. UCF supports survivors of gendered violence and it is up to all of us as a community to stand up in solidarity and work to bring an end to it. Through artistic expression, Raise the Vibration highlights the many struggles and successes women face in their lives. We have come a long way in the fight against gendered violence, but we must acknowledge we still have a long way to go. We are so grateful to have your support and to have you here to view the creative work by playwright and performer Eve Ensler. In her words, remember that we are the many and we can raise the vibration through action, art, connection, imagination, and love. Thank you for joining us and for using your compassion and creativity to make a difference. But I think for me, it's really about being able to be who I want to be, right? It's, it's about having the freedom to make a choice, um, to do what makes me happy. And again, I think, it, you know, it comes coming from the culture that I come from, uh, that's not always possible for, for women. And so I think for me, that has really defined who I am, you know, having the freedom to study what I wanted to study, work where I wanted to work, love who I wanted to love, marry who I wanted to marry, you know, just, just pretty much, you know, whether to have kids or not, you know, all of that for me, um, you know, was kind of part of the womanhood that I kind of have. Um, I think it's really about, you know, you know, being strong, independent, and at the same time, being nurturing and kind and loving to people. Uh, you know, I, I in the Indian culture, there's the, the traditional norms are are major, and and even today, they're they're followed to a T, like arranged marriages, you know, things like that. It, it's just, um, I I think I feel very lucky that I have been able to be the woman that I really want to be and that I see myself as being. I feel like uh, women are highly powerful just because if we look back through history, we're going to see that we have been targeted, oppressed, silenced, um, violated, and so many other negative um, forms of treatment. However, today we're seeing that we're able to be leaders and we're able to express our concerns freely and we're able to conduct change. So I think that resiliency will be the best form to define our experiences. Womanhood is about power in your identity and resilience against like patriarchy. And I would say like cishet normativity too. Uh, I would say feminism and power in womanhood uh, is a lot of the inspiration behind a lot of LGBTQ plus advocacy and ideals and honestly social justice advocacy. So I think, again, womanhood to me is power and identity, regardless of patriarch patriarchal frames. Like womanhood, you know, can mean so many different things to different people. And every that's, I think, part of everybody's journey is figuring out themselves. I think it's a real um, heartfelt question. And it took me a long time to figure that out because society is so loud kind of telling you what a woman should be or what a woman looks like or what a woman is supposed to do. And for a long time, I struggled with that because I didn't really fit in with that. And I almost rebelled against that. Um, I got pink on. Back in the day, I never would have worn pink. It was like black every day, all the time, because I'm like, I'm not a girly girl, but then I'm not a woman. And I, I struggled with that. I'm going to be 50 years old this year. And I think I'm still like changing every day, even what womanhood uh, means to me. And I think that that's okay. And recognizing that that's okay um, as learning to become yourself and learning how to be true to you. I, uh, you know, there is that nurturing component, but so much of the focus is nurturing other people. And we don't spend enough time talking about nurturing ourselves and our souls, you know, and to recognize 
you know, my womanhood is my path and my journey. And I don't put that on anyone else. Like no one has to be a mother, give birth. You don't have to have a vagina, right? We can just be ourselves and express ourselves how we want to be expressed. Today, I have makeup on. Tomorrow, if I'm not on Zoom on camera, I might not even brush my hair and that's okay. It doesn't take away from, from who I am as a woman. And so I really believe it's a condition of your heart and to take care of yourself and your heart first. It just means just kind of existing how I am. Um, you know, living my everyday life, being the best self that I can be. Not sure exactly how to answer, but I was thinking about, um, you know, if you've ever been asked how you define yourself, if you have to use three words to define yourself, this is like an icebreaker that sometimes is used. And the, some of the words, two of the words that I always use are woman and feminist. Um, and those, you know, probably in that order, but maybe feminist and, and women second, um, because this is really ha has defined my identity in, in so many ways in terms of uh, the causes that I work for. Um, how I how I build relationships with people, and really, uh, what what gives my life meaning is is you know the work that that I'm doing uh, in terms of feeling that I'm making an, an impact and doing something to to better this this planet. Hopefully, I think celebrating each other and bringing people up. Um, women are so strong and powerful and can bring so much to the table. And I think to know that. You know, there's people in your corner supporting you, um, whether it's on campus, off campus, um, your friends, your family, whoever that may be for you, knowing that you have people to reach out to and support you. Um, that's how I see it. And um, that's what I hope I do for my friends and family, too. And womanhood means so much. I can't even narrow it down. Um, but the first thing that comes to mind when I think about womanhood is really strength, right? So women are so complex and dynamic in so many ways. And there's so many, um, you know, different layers of, um, of a human anyway, but especially with women, I feel like there's a lot of layers there. And there are a lot of social norms that we either give into or we don't. And some of them are very personal to us. For me, I know that uh, femininity is important. You know, I, I embrace that part of me as a woman, but then I also embrace that um, strong willed person who can continue to fight for equality and do what's right for everybody to feel free. And I guess true freedom is that we don't have those constructs, right? And so that comes around a lot when we're talking about gender norms in the LGBTQ community because. Uh, in an ideal situation, you wouldn't have those norms and you would just be. I had a great desire to lift women and girls from a secondary place where I think they reside. I need to share that magical world of feeling like a woman, being creative, demanding, entrepreneur, observant, diligent, committed, engaging, warrior, the list goes on and on. Womanhood means so much to me. Um, we are fierce. We are sassy. We are warriors. We are powerful. We are influencers. We are sensitive. We are nurturers. We are so much. Like, I cannot imagine what this world would be without women. Showing up in my truth meaning showing up for my woman game game to celebrate their successes, to celebrate their wins as my wins, to, to sow into them spiritually, financially, emotionally, physically, you know, hey, you want to go for a bike ride, girl? I got you. Let's go do this. Let's go get fit. So that's how I celebrate womanhood is I celebrate the other women around me. I celebrate my women game. Being a woman has been, it, it is, is a is one of my most prized identities. Um, it gives me an opportunity to connect. It gives me an opportunity to bridge gaps. Um, you know, I think my role um, in, is to lead, to be clear and articulate and, and a full scope human, um, to really look at um, all of the vast sides, um, pr perspectives, of circumstances and people and figure out a place to come toward them, to meet them 
um, and then figure out a way forward together. So, um, you know, I think women are phenomenal leaders, are phenomenal connectors, are phenomenal strategizers. I think womanhood is what each individual person makes it. For me, it's so inclusive. When I think about womanhood, I think about all the women who have impacted my own life. So my mother, my grandmother, sister, friends, professors, poets, activists, elders, cultural workers. They've all in their own way impacted my life um, and how I see and experience the world. And they've cared for me, they've supported me and taught me. And so one aspect of womanhood that I really value is this concept of community, that we care for each other, we support each other, uh, and the sisterhood is really strong. So womanhood to me um, brings to mind strength. I think about choices, flexibility, um, and honoring vulnerability. It's about empowerment and connection and having the ability to be able um, to feel supported and loved um, because you are a woman and because women are powerful and have the ability to be able to uplift each other um, and help each other feel like they can do anything. I'm gonna talk about womanhood from my personal life experiences because I never wanna define what womanhood would mean for another person. So I'm gonna just share a few experiences that really encapsulate how I see womanhood. Um, so I am, I was in college in the 1970s and um, I was a feminist and continue to be a feminist. I was one of those college students who ran around campus getting signatures on equal rights amendment petitions. And that was extremely important to me. And I supported that amendment in the 1970s. And of course, it's still going on. The debate about the ERA continues to this day. So I'm still a supporter. I think that's part of where some of my very early interest in social justice work began. And, and I was very active in that and continue to, like I said, have interest in activities around that. But I'm also going to define my womanhood, talk about my womanhood in perhaps a little bit more of a traditional way. Um, I think of my womanhood in terms of being a mother. I have two children. I'm mama, they call me mama. And they have taught me some of the most incredible life lessons. You know, when people say they are my heart, they are my heart. They've taught me about love and kindness and respect. And so part of my life, a big part of my life and how I see myself as a woman is around that being a mother. My vagina is angry. It is. It's pissed off. My vagina is furious and it needs to talk. It needs to talk about all this shit and it needs to talk to you. So what's the deal? An army of people out there spending their days constructing psycho products to undermine my pussy. Vagina motherfuckers. There's those exams. There has got to be a better way to do those exams. Why? The scary paper dress that scratches your tits and crumbles when you lie down so you feel like a wad of paper someone threw away. Why? The mean rubber gloves or the Nazi steel stirrups or the flashlight like Nancy Drew working against gravity and those mean, cold duck lips. My vagina is angry about those exams. It gets defensive weeks in advance. It won't leave the house, and then you get there. Don't you hate it? Scoot down, relax your vagina. Why? So you can shove mean, cold duck lips in there? I don't think so. Why can't they find some nice, delicious purple velvet to wrap me in, or lay me down on a nice, feathery cotton spread? Lay my feet on some nice, fur covered stirrups, warm up the duck lips, work with my vagina. Vaginas need to move and spread and talk and talk. Vaginas want comfort. Make something like that, something to give women pleasure. <gasps> no, hate to see a woman having pleasure, particularly sexual pleasure. Why can't they make some nice comfortable pair of cotton underwear with a French tickler built in? 
women would be coming all day long, coming in the supermarkets, coming in the subways, coming happy vaginas. If my vagina could talk, it would talk about itself, like me. <laughs> it would talk about other vaginas. It would do vagina impressions. <laughs> my vagina would wear Harry Winston diamonds. No clothing, just there, all draped in diamonds. <laughs> My vagina helped release a giant baby. It thought it would be doing more of that, but it's not. But now it wants to read things and know more and travel and get out more. It doesn't want a lot of company. It wants sex. It loves sex. It wants to go deeper. It's hungry for depth. It wants warm liquids and gentle touch and warm kisses. It wants chocolate. It loves chocolate. It wants to scream and it wants, it wants to stop being angry. My vagina wants to want, it wants, my vagina will, it wants everything. It have enriched my life in many ways. For me, I think having a support system like I talked about is really just something crucial. Going back to it again, I think the overarching theme for me is just a lot of self-doubt sometimes. And when you're in these types of positions, you need motivation. So I think the women who have supported me in my life, you know, for me, my mom, most first and foremost, she's just been so supportive and really taught me that self-confidence starts from within. And, you know, the more that you speak with people and learn about self-confidence, the more that's going to build. And I think for me, full circle, having that support system, but also supporting them back really just builds that self-confidence within and that support system overall. I think of women who enrich my life. I actually start with thinking of just my mom. Uh, my mom was a doctor. And I think about how she gave me such a unique perspective being a woman in a very male dominated field. Most practitioners in any field are men. Uh, so I got a very unique perspective of the struggle and work she had to do to get into her field. And then I think every day, uh, female perspectives and like womanhood and femme perspectives just in general gives such a unique perspective to any kind of rooted theory. So when I'm learning as a therapist about some theory of counseling, I always like to apply a feminist perspective to that theory because it expands upon it so much more than the original perspective could give me. My sister's probably like the biggest enrichment that I've had, um, just watching her be successful and she's younger than me. And so watching her grow up and come into her own has been super enriching for me because I can see her become the person that she's always wanted to be. Sometimes when we think about um, mentors and those women who, you know, enriched your life, sometimes we think of um, somebody older, somebody from our past. Um, but the women who have impacted my life the most have been my daughters. And they have helped me um, break out of traditions because to break out of a tradition of society for myself, I didn't feel like maybe I was worth it or had the strength for it. I was just kind of going through the motions, um, but bringing up my daughters and seeing how different they are and even how society put things on them that really encouraged me to break out of those traditions and to fight for them to be themselves and be true to them. And so they, my daughters actually have enriched my life more than any other woman because they helped me see the worth of a human and the worth of a woman and, um, how we need to, to break from those traditions. I come from a long line of women with no brothers and my dad died when I was a young teenager. I thought the world was a woman. So for me, um, it is the most incredible species of all. Women have enriched my life in so many different ways. I um, was raised by a single mother and so she is my shero like she's the first person that i look to for advice she's the person that i look to um to celebrate she's the first person that i look to when i'm i'm struggling and i'm having a tough time
love men. I think men are the coolest. But you don't really need them to live. I cannot pinpoint the exact moment I realized that I, as a woman, was wary of men in society. But I feel like it's always been there. I don't like to go to male doctors. I don't like to be in places with men I don't know well. I don't like to walk anywhere alone at night. I don't like to ride in Ubers alone. I lock my car the second I get inside of it. I am hyper vigilant of my surroundings wherever I go. Before leaving for college, my dad bought me a women's self-defense kit that consisted of an alarm, multiple pepper sprays, and a taser. I've had things mansplained to me about topics I'm very knowledgeable on. A boy once told me, abolish the 19th Amendment, after I had given a speech on climate change. I have been told by a male teacher that boys will be boys. I have seen my friends pick apart their own physical features, remarking that their pores are too big or their thighs aren't small enough. I had a man call me a bitch for telling him to stop making fun of a woman's accent. I know women who are afraid to speak up in fear of losing their jobs or being thought of as an annoyance. I fear that my career in the arts or beyond will be manhandled and controlled by men in power. The sad thing is, I could keep going on with this list. Probably forever. Women are constantly attacked in society. Attacked for the way they dress, the way they look, the way they speak, what music they listen to, who they date, etc, etc. Women are pit against each other. Men call assertive women crazy. They don't believe women. They make women an enemy and call them overdramatic. They say they're too weak, too sensitive, too soft to be in positions of power. A man said to me once that a woman couldn't be president because she'd get too emotional during her period. Loving yourself as a woman is the greatest revolution there is because there is so much out there telling you that you shouldn't. Ever since I was younger, I had to fight against the urge to see other women as competition and instead see them as my sisters. I've had to fight every day against the internalized misogyny that has been ingrained in my mind. I had to start reprogramming my brain to think differently, to love myself, all of myself, to encourage the women around me, to speak up and to never shut up. Thank you to my mother and to every woman who has ever inspired me to stay loud. The fight is far from over. I keep meeting women who I've heard all my life are bitchy and pushy and so on and so forth. I meet them and they're, they're nice, compassionate people. It's if, if you don't play your role, you know, if you dare to aspire to something, then, then you get it automatically. But it's hard for me to remember that. No one deserves to feel unsafe or to be hurt. Um, gendered violence is pervasive in this world. It impacts so many people, so many women. No community is immune. Um, it's, it affects every community. Um, so for us to be truly free and truly liberated, we have to end gendered violence. And after that, I um, became active in a women's collective that was, um, you know, this was long be before the Me Too movement or kind of the, the new awareness on campus sexual assault. But I had a, a lot of friends and there was a lot of stories of, of women who had been sexually assaulted at my small liberal arts college. And so the women's collective started uh, collecting those stories and writing them down um, this was like, the internet was barely a thing at this point. Um, so we actually wrote them down in a book in order to kind of document what was happening and try and pressure the administration to actually take some action because there, there just wasn't any, there was a total lack of seriousness um, in terms of these types of incidents. So that's when I uh, kind of had my feminist awakening and um, really became involved in in this issue and then on this when I went off on my little tangent earlier um but but again you know I, I view violence against women as a as a form of oppression as one of the the signs um of women's um oppression in our society and like I said before it, it it's entirely preventable you know it's um not easy to prevent I'm not saying that we've definitely struggled with that and are learning a lot of lessons but it, I think that addressing violence against women um, is one way in which women can, can feel safer and be safer. So not only are women often not safe in interpersonal relationships, but they, we also have to police our own actions. Uh, you know, for example, you know, going out at, alone at night, 
Um, women feel scared, they don't do that. So we're not able to live our, our fullest lives um, with often within relationships uh, because of violence that we're experiencing. And then also we have to, to pull back for our own safety concerns in situations because of the fears of violence and working to protect ourselves. Um, so in, 19, um, in 1993, uh, my sister was killed by her husband. And that kind of opened my eyes to domestic violence before that. You know, it wasn't something that we talked about. Nobody really, it was kind of hush hush, um, even more shameful, you know, and quiet than it is now. Uh, so nobody ever talked about it, uh, didn't know any red flags. And of course the hindsight is you can see all the red flags and you start wondering like, like what coulda, woulda, you know, if I had done something, would things have been different? She was trying to get out of the relationship and he found out. And that whole, if I can't have you, no one can. It's a very real thing. And so that raised my awareness, but I had a lot of healing to do. First, getting over that, um, that bitterness, that anger, that guilt that you feel. Um, and after I healed from all of that, and then I was able to uh, make that decision like, okay, now I'm going to do something else uh, for other people so that that's not anybody else's story. Femicide was coined in Mexico in the 1970s due to the killings of women just for being a woman. And uh, or the World Health Organization explains that at any killing a woman and a girl is considered a femicide. Why kill women? Because it is accepted, tolerated and justified in the name of controlling gender expectations and gender-based discrimination. Has the right to be in a place that is safe, to feel heard and honored, um, to be in a place that they feel comfortable, that they can rely on, that they can anticipate is more likely to be a positive space than not. And creating spaces like that, that's where you get people to be their very best. So ending gendered violence is important uh, because one, I think it's possible. I think that uh, even in the short time that I've been doing this work, uh, which is a little over a decade, I have seen a shift um, in the way that college students uh, think about gendered violence, talk about consent. I have had very close family members who have experienced um, gender violence. Um, and so I think about them and I think about the fact that I love them and I want them to, to be in a good place in life. And, and that gender violence has caused a lot um, of hurt in their life. And so, you know, it's about pulling people out of that. Um, but then the, the other pieces, thinking about how no one is deserving of, of gender violence. Um, it is important that we really think about what are all of the root causes of the gender violence and how do we get rid of those root causes so that it truly stops. Um, I, I want this world to look at women and value women for everything that they can give, the power of their leadership, the ability to be able to influence really great things, um, the ability for, for them to truly make a difference in the world. And I think that you know gender-based violence is really rooted in the fact that people don't believe in women in the way that they need to. You know, historically, and currently, and around the world, there are so many manifestations of gendered bias. And so whenever I see behavior like that, you know, this is a, supposedly one of the common themes throughout human history, acts of violence against women. Think about that. That's incredible that this is something that's a constant in our world. And so, um, I think it's, for me, I reflect on what is reinforcing this? Because, you know, behavior that continues is somehow being supported. And so I think about messages, messages that we give to our children. And again, I'm going to speak from my own experience. As a young girl, I remember learning specific lessons about 
being vigilant, looking over my shoulder, having my keys out in the garage, um, taking self-defense. I learned and was encouraged to learn ways to protect myself. But I don't know that we do it from the, the other perspective. How much direct education, direct instruction do we give our boys that says, don't be violent against women, do not do it. So what is created by that is a culture in which we teach women to protect or people who are um, subject of gendered violence, we teach them to protect themselves, but what are we doing on the other extreme? What messages are we saying, don't do that? Don't, don't create that situation. Um, I remember, and I'll just share this real quickly. I remember when my daughter started her bachelor's degree many years ago, and um, I won't name the school, but the college she was going to, they required all of the girls to take a course on um, violence, violence against women, but they didn't require the boys to take any kind of education. And she pointed that out to me and we actually called the school and said, what are you doing here? Just stop your crying, it's a sign of the times. Welcome to the final show. Hope you're wearing your best clothes. You can't bribe the door on your way to the sky. You look pretty good down here, but you ain't really good. being an ear to listen. <laughs> Sometimes it's easy to talk, but it's very difficult to listen. So I like to be um, a non-judgmental support for my community, for my friends, for those people around me. I also like to externalize my emotions by art, as we can see behind me. Um, I also like to uh, offer empowering statements to friends when I see them uh, being successful in their lives in social media, supporting their work, or even um, giving them a shout out when it's needed to kind of like boost that moral. I think trying to lift other women up is so important. You know, I try to make an effort to um, always lift up, trying to shut down anytime um, we have people who are engaging in negative conversations and negative behaviors about other women. That drives me crazy. You know, even if we disagree with each other, it's important that we lift each other up. And by that, I mean really supporting each other, even when those systems may not be exactly aligned with our beliefs um, and knowing that everybody's kind of struggling with their own stuff and coming from their own perspective. And that, you know, overall we have a, uni a unification, which is that we have this unique experience as women. And I think that's important to recognize and it's a way that we can connect with each other. So I, I'm all into celebrations, like be it birthdays, anniversaries, whatever it is. So um, I have a great group of friends and we always make it a point to, to get together and just talk and you know whether it's a glass of wine or it's you know going out for a little dinner, of course it's all been over Zoom lately. <laughs> so, so I'm always trying to find ways that I can empower or uplift other people or women, um, especially those who may not have the resources to do it themselves or, or they don't have the time to do it themselves or think about it. So, you know, I, I love pampering my sister when I see her because I know she's, you know, she doesn't have the time to do that. Or I love to take my mom on a spa day just to tell her, hey, you know, I, I really appreciate you and self-care is extremely important. And I think women really, really kind of neglect that because we're always trying to take care of other people. So I try to do that. A few years ago, um, my husband and I actually 
um, made a choice that we wanted to sponsor um, a little girl in Kenya for her education. Because again, a place where women don't always have access to all the resources um, and education is really that key that can open doors. So um, we, you know, we have a, a church that we partnered with and um, they um, run a little school in my hometown. And so, you know, it, it was all these connections that just felt right. And um, she was four at that time and she's eight now. So it's just, it's been wonderful to just watch her thrive. And, you know, we communicate, she sends us letters, we send her letters back. So I, I think it's little things like that too. You know, for us, it's not much to send a monthly donation, but I think for her, it's absolutely life-changing. And, and, and it's, I think the donation probably would cost me what I would spend on lunch or something, you know, maybe once or twice a week. And for her, it pays for her, her education, her clothing, and her medical care for an entire month. And so I think that that was just, um, you know, for us, it's it's those little things and, and any opportunity that we can get to help somebody, you know, uplift them and empower them. Yeah, I think um, obviously right now it's hard with COVID, um, but I have a group of friends who get together. We hope to try to get together at least once a month um, to do something, whether, you know, for a while it was just on Zoom. We were just having um, times where we could celebrate each other, whether it's birthdays or, um, you know, exciting times in our lives. A lot of us um, all acquired new positions in, in our workplaces um, over the last few months. So just celebrating that. Um, again, it's it's different right now. We can't always be together, but um, even just a simple text and like, I'm proud of you goes a long way. So I try to just reach out to my friends when I can and show my support um, and love for them because they um, mean so much to me. Um, I, I try to remind women um, about their power. I often look around the, the table and just make sure that women are represented um, at the table. Um, you know, I, I try to uplift as much as possible, whether it's helping women see how important they are to the world, um, the contributions that they bring, and in their ability to make a difference. Um, I am particularly watchful of those who um, I see want to contribute, but for some reason there's fear um, to contribute. And so what I try to do is I try to bring that out of them. Um, and I think that that's the, the important piece in celebrating womanhood. It's not just about giving compliments, but it's also about how are you breaking down barriers? How are you helping to advance women? How are you helping to make space for women and amplify their voices? It can start as early as five years old when a girl in your kindergarten class tells you where babies come out. You're immediately suspicious of down there and decide to ask other women about theirs, which leads to their gasps and a harsh talking to from your mother. Suddenly, you're afraid of your anatomy. It gets worse when your body starts to change. You outgrow your clothes more and more quickly these days. It feels like your jeans get tighter every morning and it's getting harder to breathe. You refuse to look at yourself naked, even though the bathroom mirror is directly in front of your shower. That weird week in health class where you have to bring in a permission slip to watch cartoons about growing up doesn't clear anything up, but makes it more uncomfortable. It becomes a looming warning. Everything is about to change. You cry when you accidentally see your body in the mirror and understand the evidence. Just like last time, you get in trouble for your questions, so you learn to stop asking. Sometimes you're brave enough to Google some squirming details or to watch R-rated movies at sleepovers. When you whisper to someone that you think you might have an eating disorder, she kindly tells you that you aren't fat enough to have one. You learn to stop whispering, too. You think it'll get better when partners start to touch you, but that elation only lasts a moment, if you get it at all. Sometimes all you can think about is what your parents would say if they knew. You don't touch yourself because you have a partner now, not because of your lasting fear of down there, of course not. Your partner's desires pose a terrifying question. Do you love yourself enough to show yourself? And it's in that moment that you realize you don't love yourself enough, not at all. Women feel this way because these are the messages we're given from the age of five. We feel fear and shame because we're told that we have to hide, even from ourselves. 
We're rendered incapable of looking at our reflections or fully enjoying intimacy, and as such, we struggle to properly see our beauty. Women's comfort falls below our need to appease the world. Only now is this conversation gaining traction, and thank God for that. Body positive activists and sex educators will really save us all. They tell us the things that seem so simple but aren't. We are beautiful and free. We have the right to be ourselves, no matter our shape, size, or sexual activity. We can voice our support by following positive social media activists. A small task, but one that can be crucial to becoming comfortable with our existences. That comfort is the key to all of us uniting in a profound truth. We should not be afraid. We should not have to be.